Good evening. <laughs> I am Brooke Clement. I'm the director here at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library Museum. And it is my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Uh, we are wrapping up our, our winter spring programming this evening with tonight's guest, Doug Stanton. So um, I'm so glad that you're here because we will not be seeing you for the next couple months. <laughs> um, just want to, again, thank you all for all the support that you give us and also thank our great partners at the foundation. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joel Westfall, our deputy director here, to introduce tonight's speaker. Good evening, everyone. So before I kind of begin, if everybody can uh, remember to please uh, silence your cell phones, that would be much, uh, much appreciated. Thank you very much. So we have had a great partnership uh, with Armed Forces Thanksgiving for quite some time, uh, about 2018, and we've had an Armed Forces Thanksgiving lecture uh, here or via Zoom uh, ever since then. Um, I first met our, um, uh, our, our upcoming author here, our upcoming lecturer, uh, back in 2017 and had a great first meeting. And, I really wanted him really, really bad to come here and do, do a lecture uh, quite some time ago. And um, of course, when I came here, I had all these other people who I wanted to come here as well. I had uh, Secretary Mattis, who I ended up getting, um, Sir Anthony Beaver, who I ended up getting, my dear departed friend, uh, Jim Hornfisher, uh, another major naval historian who I also got. Uh, but it was it was Jim it was uh, it was Doug who was one of the hardest ones to finally lock in and get him here to do his uh, to do his uh, talk about uh, his books. Now, of course, uh, Doug has a great excuse because he was busy working on Echo, and I totally get that. And we are very very, very thankful to have him here today. So just a little bit about uh, Doug, Doug Stanton. Uh, Doug is the number one New York Times bestselling author, lecturer, screenwriter. His books include The Odyssey of Echo Company, In Harm's Way, and Horse Soldiers. This is echoing a little bit. Uh, Horse, uh, Horse Soldiers was the basis uh, for the Jerry Bruckheimer produced movie 12 Strong, starring Chris Hemsworth and Michael Shannon, released by Warner Brothers. Today, Horse Soldiers is required reading by the United States Army Special Forces at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and School. In Harm's Way uh, is the definitive account of the sinking, rescue, and valor of the sailors on board the USS Indianapolis. Uh, he spent more than six months, uh, that book spent more than six months on the New York Times bestseller list and became required reading at the US Navy, uh, on the US Navy's reading list for officers. Doug's latest book, The Odyssey of Echo Company, was the Military Times Best Book of the Year and the recipient of the Society of Midlands Authors Best Nonfiction Book Award. He has lectured at libraries, civic, corporate groups, bookstores, universities, the United States State Department, the Center for Strategic, Strategic International Studies, he has recently appeared with Lynn Novak on, uh, as co-producer on CBS's The Vietnam War, on C-SPAN's American History, also to discuss the Vietnam War. I am very pleased uh, to introduce our lecturer for tonight, Michigan's own Doug Stanton. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you, Brooke, as well, and everyone for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Doug Stanton. I'm from Traverse City. I don't know why it took so long to get here, um, um, but I'm very glad to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to speak uh, mostly about the World War II book, In Harm's Way, which is about the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. I have some prepared remarks which I'd like to read, and then show a short video of my research trip with my wife, Ann Stanton, who's sitting there, raise your hand, please, yeah, who is a reporter and taught me how to be a reporter uh, when I began this career as a magazine writer um, 25 years ago. Um, and then we can talk about the moment of that video and kind of the discoveries of that videotape and, and, and end our evening by moving forward 
and talking about the Odyssey of Echo Company. In between is the book um, Horse Soldiers. Has anyone seen the movie 12 Strong? Yes, a couple of you. It, th that book has uh, inspired uh, the movie. Um, much of the movie is based upon that book. And that is about America's response to 9-11 um, in October of 2001. I've just recently updated that book. As we know, um, things have changed uh, all kinds of ways in Afghanistan after 20 years. Um, and, f and you can read about the updates. I went back and interviewed a lot of people that I touched base with in, uh, when I was writing the book, and um, kind of caught us up there. There are some threads that run through these three books, but by starting with In Harm's Way, I think it sets the stage where we can talk about some themes. Um, because tonight's talk, <clears throat> when you asked me for a title, I came up with, When Ordinary People Do Extraordinary Things, Reflections on Risk, Citizenship, and the Hero Next Door. The, and, a, and a subtitle I wrote, The Importance of Remembering the Past to create a future. These are themes that run through all three of these books. So they're not necessarily for those of you who might feel allergic to a book about war or combat. I want you to know they're not really ostensibly just about bullets and bombs exploding. They're about real people moving through time on the fabric of history, trying to make the hardest decision you know, at the hardest moment. And um, that's how I approach my writing. These, um, you know, this title, really is inspired by uh, lessons from my father, to be quite honest, which is how I got into writing In Harm's Way, my very first book. So I'd like to read <clears throat> this remarks I have a, about that because it touches on uh, the importance of remembering the past to create a future. And then we'll um, get more deeply into the ship itself. <clears throat> and I hope that th these remarks resonate uh, with some of you. They certainly um, do with me. <clears throat> it's called Home After Dinner. This is a story about remembering and forgetting. It involves my father, who was five at the time, and it involves me, who was eight, when I first heard it from him. Leonard Daly had a brother named R.L. who ran the bait shop on the Hersey River where the main road out of Reed City crosses the river. This was the last place I remember seeing my grandfather alive, except for the hospital room right after he'd had his heart attack. But on this day, by the river, he is wearing a slouch hat and his glasses, and I can barely hear him above the roar of the river water and the damn spillway. All I remember now is him waving at us, telling my father something like he would be home in a little while, maybe after dinner. If you drive north out of Reed City on this road, you can still see the building that housed R.L.'s old bait shop. Only the river is a placid little thing, a brown oily ribbon that flows around the edge of the town. The last time I saw my grandfather was the last time I remember uh, seeing the river because shortly after that, that summer, the dam blew out and the river went down. And all I remember was that after my grandfather died, the river seemed to have disappeared too. Where do we go when no one remembers us? If we do not tell what we know and do not pass it on, where does the knowledge go? These are the questions that I think were plaguing my father the day he told me about Leonard Daly. One day when he was five, my grandmother had tied my father to a towering willow tree in the yard of their little house on Bittner Avenue on the east edge of Reed City. World War II was on, and his two uncles, his mother's brothers, were in Europe fighting. The world, you could say, seemed a smaller place, a place where you could tie your child up in the front yard with a soft rope to a tree, and no one would think you were being cruel. My grandmother was in the house. Across the road was dad's grandmother's own house as well. It was, as I say, a small world. My father was sitting there with his rope when up the robe came this handsome man in a crisp army uniform. He had a girl on his arm. The man scooped up 
the men um, scooped down over the fence, picked up my father, untied him, and went into the house to ask my grandmother if he could take him along for the day. She said yes, amazingly. <laughs> Leonard told her that they were going to the county fair. What my father remembers of that day is lost in the mist, the way my own memory is lost in the mist of the river as I see my grandfather, his father, standing there on the bank by the dam. What my father does remember is, is the fine time he had with Leonard and his girlfriend. At the end of the day, Leonard delivered him back to the yard, and after that day, he never saw Leonard again. In fact, he really thought about Leonard. He remembered asking his mother one day when he was a teenager, whatever happened to Leonard Daly? Oh, said his mother, he died in the war. Shortly after that day, you saw him. It struck my father that he had forgotten Leonard for all those years, and in some ways, this too had been a kind of death, as if Leonard had died twice, once in the war and once in my father's memory. Shortly after that, my father was sitting in 12th grade English when he got up to sharpen his pencil and looked out the window. It was spring. The sun was shining. In a year, he would be in Alaska, in the army himself, and in three more years, married to my mother. His whole life was ahead of him, but he could see none of it yet. Up the street came a green tractor pulling a hay wagon, bearing a casket draped with a flag. Some veterans from World War II were walking alongside the wagon as it bumped along. This was the late 1950s, years after the war. My father asked the teacher what the parade was about, and she said it was the body of a boy finally coming back from the war. He had been killed in Africa all those years ago. My father knew that it was Leonard Daly. He just knew. But where, my father wondered, had Leonard been all these years? when he had not thought of him at all. That night, his mother, uh, his mother confirmed what he'd already guessed. It was the body of Leonard Daly coming home. That's why I think my father has always told me this story, as a way of saying, be the kind of person who remembers others and who is remembered. He has never said that out loud, but the meaning is implied. It's inside this story, the way music seems to come from inside the piano, all at once, from everywhere, and from nowhere in particular. So where do we go if we are not remembered? The truth is, we are forgotten. And there is nothing to be done about that, except by the act of conjuring this remembering which burns brightly as long as these sentences last. Sometimes when I'm alone in the woods or when I'm writing, I can hear this music. I feel as if I'm telling the story or a story to arrive at that music in a sunlit clearing where someone is playing and that in that clearing it's suddenly quiet and I can hear a voice, it's my grandfather's again, talking to me down by the river, telling me, don't worry, that he would be home after dinner. Thank you for listening to that. Um, it really does capture what I think a historian tries to do, right? It, what, what a historian can be kind of a very personal, impersonal, academic affair, right? And um, uh, filled with books and footnotes and and ideas and dry facts, but at one level also at its heart, it's also about trying to tell the story of what it means to be alive right now and, and remembering us and memorializing, you know, the small acts of heroism the, and the large global acts um, that, uh, that also affect us all. I tend to approach it more from this second uh, doorway, which is the small acts of uh, human frailty, human hero, the heroism, et cetera, and through which we, I look at, as a lens at, at larger things. And in, in this case, um, uh, World War II and this book, In Harm's Way. It was writing or having that experience growing up with my father uh, that really allowed, you know, pushed me to write this book. Um, 
he, he, as you can sense from the, the essay, he was deeply affected by World War II. He grew up with uncles who were there. And uh, he was always telling me, uh, you know, you should pay attention. You should go ask, a, go ask so-and-so a question about what it was like to be in the war. Um, he was always telling me that about a fellow named Billy Grant, who my father was a uh, electric lineman for the uh, for the city and the power company, so he climbed telephone poles and and so on. And Billy Grant had been in Vietnam, and I'd come back, and Vietnam was beyond me. I was too young to really understand it. Uh, and he said, "You ought to go ask Billy Grant what he did in the war," and I never did. And um, however, I did up. I ended up asking a gentleman named Stan Parker, whom I didn't know, and I wrote a, a, a book, kind of an homage to my father, saying you ought to pay attention to the Vietnam World too. Um, <clears throat> in all these books as a writer, as a parent, as a citizen, as a reporter going out into this room right now and kind of talking with you and figuring out your life and asking you, you know, trying to build a rapport and relationship. The question that um, often I think about is who is watching us, right? Who is, who, who is watching? Uh, is it God? Is it a God? Is, it, is, is there no such thing? It, it, whomever, however you choose to answer that question. And it, because it, it, it when you interview as many people as I have who have found themselves in extreme situations, you know, facing death minutes away, and I'm, I'm assuming, and I'm quite sure many of you in this audience have, if you've been in combat, have felt this moment too. You wonder who the heck is watching? Like, who's in charge here? Right? What, uh, you know, and, and the realization is often, well, that hopefully there is someone up there watching, but for the meantime, I'm just going to pretend that we're all going to watch out for each other, right? Um, <clears throat> this, these remarks are called Who is Watching? And they center on the experience of the USS Indianapolis. And this grows out of the, um, as I said, my experience with my father. Um, I think that the story of the USS Indianapolis is a story about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. I th also think this story is about doing the right thing at the least likely, the least opportune moment, which for me defines uh, true heroism. Heroism, I've come to learn, as I've talked with these men and their families, is a matter of doing the right thing even when no one is looking, especially when no one is looking. I'm going to read a short section from this book. Um, it's July 1945. It's just after midnight. Our ship, the USS Indianapolis, is hit by torpedoes, and it sinks 12 minute, in 12 minutes. The ship is two football fields long, and it's hard to believe that it sinks so quickly. It's in some of the deepest water on Earth. We think, and I'm now going to make us all members of this ship, we think in this room, as the ship goes down in 12 minutes, we've been torpedoed. Um, it is, as I say, July 1945. We're headed to the Philippines. We're going to be training for an invasion of Japan later in that year. We've just delivered secret bomb components in a plywood crate, which no one really, we don't know what that is. It turns out to be the components to the atomic bomb Little Boy, which will be dropped on Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. But we, we in this room on this ship, on this night after midnight, human night in July, don't know what an atom is. We don't know what atomic power is. We don't know what fusion is. Um, all we know is that suddenly, as we've been sleeping on the deck, the, all of us in this room are thrown into the water. Uh, and we think that, um, well, I mean, let me put it this way. I live in Traverse City, so if Ann and I drove back tomorrow uh, up 131, and we broke down, and we think, well, my first thought is, I don't have a, two, I don't, two tires go, I don't have two spares. Someone will come looking for us soon because it's the only way home, really, right? I mean, someone's got to come eventually looking for us if we don't call, we don't make any contact, and nobody comes. So what does that mean? It means no one knows we're missing, 
right? Only we're 300 miles offshore in deep water surrounded by sharks and we have no food and we have no water. And we're 16, 17, 18 years old. Um, this section I'm about to read is from um, the moment on the third day of our ordeal um, when for me, it's a make or break moment and it gets to the heart of what this story is about. It's a Monday night when we sink, we will be rescued on Friday. Let's just say it's Wednesday. Dr. Haynes, he's 33, he's from Manistee, Michigan. He's swimming around a group of us who are masked as swimmers and we're in life vests, life vests and he's propping up our spirits and he's burying the dead. This scene raises for me several really important questions. Who did Lewis Haynes think was watching as he carried out his duties when he was floating in that oceanic void? And why did he go on at all? What code was he following that did not allow him to give up? And this is, a, this is that scene. The sun was like a hammer in the sky. As the day wore on, the bodies piled on the surface of the sea in ragged heaps that swirled as the sharks tugged them from below. And carrying on with the grim ritual he'd been dutifully executing the past three days, Dr. Haynes set out to bury the newly dead. As he paddled by, some of the boys stirred, lifting their oil-caked heads to stare bleary-eyed at the sun. Hey, Doc, take a look at this guy, will you? A few of the more lucid called out, hey doc, is this guy alive? And stroking up to one boy, Haynes gently lifted him by the hair and he peered into his eyes. Are you alive, son? Yeah, doc, I'm alive, the man croaked. Oh good, that's real good. And then he moved on to the next candidate. Son, he lifted the head. Are you with us? And there was no reply, son? Haynes tapped on the cold eyeball, and when he found a reflex, he felt an immense sense of relief. Then he moved quickly to the next boy. He tapped on again. That eye was bloodshot and swollen, a sign he knew of edema caused by the ingestion of salt water because they have been drinking it. There was no reflex. It was like touching the blank and glassy eye of a stuffed animal. Haynes decided he had to declare this sailor dead. This man is dead, he said aloud. It was strange, but saying it aloud made it feel more real, like he wasn't alone. At the sound of Haynes' voice, several boys turned to watch. More than a few of them didn't. They didn't have life vests. They were half drowning, dog paddling, arms around their comrades, all trying to stay up together. Most of them were close to giving, uh, close to giving, uh, giving up. Yet none of them wanted to let go of their charges. They were clinging to each other as if saving themselves. Haynes needed the dead boy's life vest and he moved quickly. He, untied, he tried not to look into the boy's eyes as he struggled to loosen the knotted straps. And when he was done, he removed the dog tags. He wrapped them around his own arm where they clinked. He then paddled behind the body, placed one hand on the vest collar and gave a gentle pull easing out first the shoulders and then the arms. It looked very much like removing a coat from a sleeping child. Finally, the corpse slid free from the vest and Haynes quickly tossed it aside then snatched up the body before it could sink. He was determined not to let anyone go without first praying over him. He drew the cold, wet body close, grabbed it tight in a bear hug and paused. Aboard a ship, the chaplain would do this, but Father Conway, he was close to death himself. So with his cheek pressed to the dead boy's cheek, he could smell the salt and the sweat, and he began, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Sometimes he even made it to the end of the Lord's Prayer, and often he didn't. Often he was so spent that he could do nothing more than hold the dead boy and pray in silence, feeling in his adult state that he'd been an utter failure as a doctor. He opened his arms and watched the body fall. It dropped for a long time, 
twirling feet first like a man falling down a crystalline elevator shaft, getting smaller and smaller, no bigger than a doll when it finally disappeared. Why, oh why, Haynes wondered, can't I do anything to save these boys? So, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but if I had been in that circumstance, floating in that ocean, uh, undergoing those, uh, that, that experience, my first thought wouldn't have been, you know, why can't I save? I mean, I, I'm being honest here. I mean, my, likely my first thought wouldn't have been, why can't I do to save anybody? My, our first thought is often, what are we going to do to save ourselves? Um, then something else happens, that, which is key to this story, and which is a message I want to carry forth when I'm, when I'm done here, just talking about this book. Um, some of the young men begin to untie their life vests, and they swim from the group. Maybe they weren't injured, but they believed the situation would never end. And on, on this fateful day, this turning point, there's a guy named Ed Brown, a survivor from California. He looks over at his buddy, and his buddy says to him, Ed, this is never going to stop. I'm leaving. And he swims away, and Ed never sees him again. Some men, other, some men drowned, and some were attacked by sharks. And then Ed himself almost swam away. But then he stopped, and he, but then he stopped because he heard a voice. It belonged to his father. It was a voice saying, you're Ed Brown and you don't quit. And Ed Brown didn't swim away. Dick Thalen, now deceased, but formerly of Lansing, Michigan, whom I got to know, heard a similar kind of voice. You're Dick Thalen, you don't give up. So as I traveled around uh, the US on this book tour for In Harm's Way, I began to hear a lot of these kinds of stories of how certain men had heard voices, not necessarily the voice of God, but often the voice of someone who had cared or who had at one time given them an identity as someone who doesn't quit. It was so interesting. At some point in the past, these voices had framed these men in the universe, let's say, as real individuals with real responsibilities that made them feel that they belonged somewhere in the world. So and it was these voices that kept many of them from swimming away. These voices, in fact, then, were a lifeline back to the world. And this is the key lesson, I think, in this story for me. When I was asked by a reporter uh, who was doing a radio kind of segment on why I'd written In Harm's Way, I paused. I was standing in the doorway of my office, looking out at the backyard where our kids who were young at the time were playing. And my office was strewn with maps and photographs having to do with the ship. And um, I said that the book had been a profound privilege to write. And then I told the reporter something that I hadn't thought of before, that I had wondered, and if I'd ever said anything to anyone who in a moment of their own crisis might grab and use as a lifeline to pull themselves back from their own abyss. It just came to me like a bolt. And to be honest, <clears throat> I said that I didn't know that was true, but I hoped that it was. And then I began to think more deeply about this story and so many stories that we come to, but World War II and other stories of conflict where people are thrown into an uh, existential moment where they must make hard decisions. I think that's why we read those sto these stories, who see people hopefully act in their better natures. Um, so the, what resonated for me was that it was this single voice, and then I began to telescope outward, a teacher's, a parent's, a friend's, a co-worker's, that, that could change someone's life, change the tra trajectory of someone's life. Those voices can make you feel like you belong in the world. So the question we all face every day is, what will we say to someone today, tomorrow, or the next day that they might grab onto in a time of need? How will we be a lifeline for others? That is where I ended up writing a book about a World War II ship that gets torpedoed in the Pacific Ocean in 1945, that in the end 
It's really a story about being a citizen, right? How do we take care of each other in this room if we were suddenly in this moment of duress, an existential crisis? A few lessons that <clears throat> came, if you were to extrapolate further, and I think why we are drawn to these kinds of stories is that it's been my experience that people who lived through the Indianapolis sinking and, and survived it, and while they were uh, sinking and while they were surviving, they gave up a sense of their, their selves. So in the room here, I'm gonna say some of it are in life vests, some of us are in uh, rafts, but if we're in life vests, we probably have our arms around each other and we're dog paddling, right? And they're made out of canvas and kapok and the straps are all knotted and we're sinking lower and lower and lower by the hour. So that if really we're just trying to ultimately stay afloat because the thing is trying to drown us, but we can't get it off because our hands are too swollen. Um, so we come over and I would say, I'd help you dog paddle. And you might wanna start drinking the salt water. And I'd say, don't do that. And if you did do it, you were gonna go out of your head and the group would have to push you away because then it, it's like putting Coca-Cola in your car battery. You know, it, the, the whole system just goes kaflooey. Um, what happened is the men, and the men, there were some of them were 16, 17 years old. The young men decided that they would surrender to the moment, but not give up. It's a really interesting distinction. So this book, as a young parent at the time, really was instructive to me about all kinds of different life lessons. Surrender, but don't give up. In other words, persevere. Um, uh, give up my sense of self. You know, the, Try to uh, navigate that battle between selfishness and selflessness. And interestingly enough, those veterans in the, uh, in the room here, uh, men or women, um, you know that um, when you've lived through something like this, um, at least in the case of the Indianapolis, they said, a lot of them said, I've never really had a bad day um, after I got out of that water in 1945. Um, and they mean it. You know, a lot of people say stuff like that, but you, you can't really tell that they always mean it. Um, I, so thinking about that experience and the way I think about these books is really about being a citizen, um, about taking risks, about what heroism is. Um, I want to show um, some reporting that Ann and I did in Vietnam as I wrote the book, uh, The Odyssey of Echo Company. It's about five minutes long. And <clears throat> the reason I wanna show it is I want you to begin to think um, of storytelling and history uh, is something other than just its footnotes. Um, and and by way of introducing this video, the guys of this ship, and this is true of the Vietnam veterans too that Ann and I met, when our ship sinks and all of us in this room go down and we live and get rescued, we all go home and we never talk about it. Oh, not yet. But we get together 15 years later in the hotel in Indianapolis, Indiana, for the first time, we're now 35 years old, 30, 35, and we talk about it. Hey, what happened to you? Someone over in the back there says, hey, I stand, uh, let me, I'll, just, I'll just do this. It's like this, it's the Westin Hotel. Uh, they shut the door. All the men who did show up at the reunion are sitting in seats like this. Up on the dais is the captain and some key critical uh, crew people who organized the reunion. And one of them, Giles McCoy, just says, okay, fellas, what happened? Room is dead silent, like right now. What happened? Back in the room, back of the room, stands up, shaky voice. Well, I'm afraid I killed Charlie. You're Charlie, you stand up, you didn't kill me, you idiot, I'm still here, I'm alive. You're kidding me, no, no, I killed you. No, I'm not, I'm alive, I'm standing right here. No, you gotta be kidding me, I thought I killed you all these years. 
Yeah, it goes on and on and on. They start talking to each other and creating the story, the history of what happened to them as a way to live. Because if you don't have that story, you don't know where you've been and what's happened to you, you can't, it's hard to move into the future, right? So that, this is um, one of the things I hope that my books do is they recreate, not recreate, they're based on the reporting of people involved, but they create a narrative by which they begin to understand what had happened to them. And this is especially true of this book, The Odyssey of Echo Company. It's really the same story in a way of Stanley Parker, who's not on the cover, but you'll see him in a moment, asking me if I would ever write a book about Vietnam while we're sitting in a helicopter at Bagram Airfield in Afghanistan because he'd read In Harm's Way. I was there researching horse soldiers, my book about Afghanistan. And I said, Stanley, you're 55 years old. Aren't you kind of old to still be in the Army? He said, well, I joined Special Forces. I'm here. Um, I was in Vietnam. And I sure hope you write a book someday about Vietnam. And he um, wanted to understand what had happened to them. And I think it's a serious challenge for all of us that we need to put a period on the end of the sentence, what happened to you in Vietnam, if you have those people in your family. Um, and this book, in some ways, has been a help to some, slide it across the kitchen table and say, is this close to what happened to you? You know, it's just a starter. Um, it's, um, so Ann and I, we go there. And Stan is reading a map. He's walking around. And he says, here, I think it's here. We're driving in a van. We're not walking around yet, but we're driving in a van and it stops. He goes, here, this is the place. I said, what? He goes, this is where we had the firefight. This is where I got shot. This is where I fired the rocket and blew up that building over there. I said, you're kidding me. You know, and he, because he'd been in the army so long, he really didn't know maps. So I typ typically always believed him. We had grid coordinates and everything. He gets out of the van, he steps over the scrub, and he drops down into a rice paddy, and there he is, and he's standing in the rice paddy. It's dry. He goes, this is it. I said, what? He goes, this is where it happened. I said, okay. And then he just started to shake. He had a flashback. And one of the things I've learned, and I tell this to students too, when I urge them to interview people in their family who've um, been in a war, is you don't have to fix this moment. It wasn't my, Stan did not want me to make him feel better or fix it or say anything to him. He just wanted me to stand there and basically just acknowledge it and not laugh. Right. The biggest thing that a Vietnam veteran fears is you're going to laugh at him or not pay attention or want to hear it. And I just stood there. I stand and he just, he just, he, he let it happen. And um, we began to talk. I began to pull out a small video camera and just began to film for re reporting purposes what was happening. And it was then that something truly special happened that was not scripted, although we had gone into the village earlier and made our announcement that of our presence. And uh, that announcement elicited uh, what happened next year. So I'll let this roll, and then we can talk about this story after we hear it.
this is me walking up the draw. We're on January 30th, about 4 a.m. The Tet Offensive commenced here at LZ Jane, outside the village of Hai Lang. <clears throat> the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese were running up this hill towards these positions. The way we're right over here, right up here, over here. And they came up that, that draw. Let's see. Who are you? I say, you are me, American soldiers, at this place. This was our place. He say, um, infantry, is it? Yeah. Infantry? Paint the color to, yeah. to appear at night time and kill one by one. Yeah. And when you found them here, you came and you killed them. So yeah. they had to to be killed all. Yeah. Yeah. If they, he knew that. that. He knew the reason why right. you come here. Right. He knew the if reason. If they hadn't shot him, we would have not known they were here. We would have not come, you know. He says, you were wounded. And it was why the American soldiers tried to burn things to uh, attack uh, back vengeance. to the, yeah, yeah, to the, the yeah. local yeah, yeah. Uh, soldiers. Tinko and High Note both got shot right here. It was a little further back than that, probably maybe only 25 meters. And finally, I was able to raise it up and shoot the wall across this uh, road. Road, and into that. And there was a bunker there. There, there it was a, it was a, attached to a house. There was a, a thatch hut, <coughs> and the bunker was part of it. And it went into the bunker and blew up. And that's why I got up and went over there, and the. As uh, I finish it off, the NVA, other NVA soldier come running from over that way. He ran right up beside me. He thought I was one of him, and I thought he was one of my guys. Man, this is great. I tell you what, my day has been made. Man. Oh, thank you. Yes. I, um, I've seen that video a lot, but it always, it, it, I, I still find it very moving. I hope you feel the same way. Um, it, um, it was like watching something being born there or come to life on that little picnic spot by the side of the road. You can see the look on Mr. Sin's face. You know, he's shorter than Stan, and Stan, man, my day has been made. And, he's, and he, they had never met each other before, never talked, and, and Stan had gone home in silence and brooded about Vietnam for years. And Mr. Sin had gone home as well and brooded himself alone about it for years. And the only two people in the world that really, that knew most about what had happened to them on that day were these two men these, these enemies, these strangers to each other. And by sharing their story, they walked around out of our earshot with, with our, uh, on our friend, our translator, 
and, and explain to each other just as briefly as they could in, in 45 minutes what had happened. Again, they were sharing their histories and the, um, um, it, in a way that was real and approachable and, and, and meaningful. Um, I went back to Vietnam actually when the book came out uh, and uh, this was a reporting trip and gave Mr. Sin a signed copy uh, that Stan had signed for him as well. So it sits somewhere on his shelf next to all of his Buddhist texts because he's a Buddhist priest in the village. Um, we have some time for questions. I see it's 10 to 7 right now, maybe. Um, we can talk more about um, the Vietnam book or? It's up to you, Doug. You're in charge. OK. Oh, you just. <laughs> um, are there? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned 16 and 17 year olds. Were on the Indianapolis? Correct. Yes, Gus K. from Chicago, Illinois, was 16 years old. He'd signed on the ship with his parents' permission, and I think a little, uh, and prob I'm sure still, however, still illegally. Um, and, uh, yeah. Dr. Haynes, who the, the scene I read about the life, um, I interviewed Dr. Haynes in Florida, and he's now passed away, but he was 33 one of the senior people on the ship, and the captain was 48. My husband and I both read the book, and we were in Florida, in Palmetto, which is next to Bradenton. Yeah. And we have a nice little library there. Is it, I don't know if that's on. But maybe you can hear me. And we drove in to the library, and next to us was this pickup truck with the license plate that said, Survivor of the Indianapolis. Do you, do you remember his name and how long ago this was? Okay. Yeah. I tell you, that's an interesting moment. Um, there's Harold Bray of California is the remaining survivor today. Yeah. May I ask how many survived? 316 out of a crew of 1,195 1, plus one passenger. So uh, 880 perished over the five-day ordeal. There are many ways to think about the Indianapolis story. I chose a court-martial, uh, a, a naval battle. I chose to uh, do something of different and ask these, these men, these young men, how they survived, which is what I drew most of my message from tonight about, uh, which they hadn't been asked before. It's very interesting. So, yes, sir. I, I read your book. Uh, one thing, it's been a little while, but uh, one thing that struck me was, uh, I still can't get my mind around it, was how could it take five days for a sophisticated, you can see where I'm going on the story, how could they, you know, spend five days, and it took some fly guys to fly by, happen to see them down in the ocean, as I recall. Yes. And so, you know, to lose a battleship at that time of, uh, uh, the war was, you know, well, winding down, but to for that many days, can you address that? I mean, sure. did anybody get their, you know, uh, get addressed reportedly uh, in, in a severe manner, so to speak? Somebody um, should have. Yeah, the, and the answer will perhaps shock and surprise some of us. The, the, the quick answer is the people had letters of reprimand, et cetera, uh, stains on their record, which were ultimately removed. Um, that, that's the administrative part of it. The operational part of it is that when it leaves Tinian and Guam, where it's delivered the atomic bomb components, and Tinian, exactly. It's taken off a plotting board there, just as the way we'd imagine it in the 1940s, and it's no longer the uh, oversight of that um, command. Where it's headed to uh, in the Philippines, in Leyte, um, it's never missed, although its berth remains empty in the harbor. A young officer, a sharp one, I'd have to say, remembers his directive, which is that the, the 
Arrival of combatant ships shall not be reported for security reasons. He interprets this, the non-arrival of combatant ships shall also not be reported. So when it didn't show up, it did not raise a, su a sufficient red flag. And um, many ships, you know, there's much is happening, but you're exactly right. A fellow named Chuck Gwynn and his crew are flying over and he spots an oil slick, which he thinks might be an enemy ship that's disabled. Or, and he, he, he dives to bomb it and pulls up suddenly when he sees that there are what he thinks are coconuts floating in the water, but they're really hundreds of young men with oil, fuel bunker oil, covering their face and they're waving at him. And thus commences one of the largest rescue efforts of the war. But um, mostly your, your weekend boating experience has more sophisticated electronics than were available uh, on that ship. Uh, not that they weren't sophisticated in their plotting and, and their navigation, but you know, just, I mean, it was another world. Someone else. Yes. Okay, that was the operational part. I said it may surprise us. Thank you for reminding me. Um, the captain of the ship, Charles Butler McVeigh III, comes from a distinguished family of naval officers. When this happens to him, he is court-martialed and becomes the only captain in U.S. history for being court-martialed for losing his ship as an act of war. Lots of ships are sunk. McVeigh is pinned with this disaster. Why? Well, remember, 880 young men have just died, what turns out to be actually just weeks before the war's end, which of course we didn't know then. In fact, while the rescue is going on from August 2nd to August 6th, 1945, what happens on August 6th, 1945? The atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima. This happens while some of them are in their hospital beds beginning to convalesce. So America wants answers quickly. McVeigh is, has not done one thing on his journey from Tinian Island to the Philippines. And that is he is not during high visibility time on the night of July 30th, 1945, zigzagged. If any of you are sailors, you know it's basically tacking across the water as a defensive posture against a torpedo, which is negligible value. The moon comes out, the ship two football fields long, should have been zigzagging at that moment. It isn't, the officer on the deck couldn't have commanded it to begin that maneuver that quickly anyway, and then the moon, the clouds close in and the moon disappears. However, in that window, Commander Hashimoto of the I-58 <clears throat> has come up and he spots a smudge on the horizon, which is the USS Indianapolis, he begins to track it. And then he begins to sink it. It gets interesting because Hashimoto is called to Washington, D.C. at McVeigh's court-martial and testifies, even if McVeigh had been zigzagging, that was the charge. So your ship is sunk, Captain. You weren't zigzagging, uh, therefore it was sunk because you weren't zigzagging. Mc Hashimoto says, now imagine, the war has just ended. You're a Japanese submarine commander. You've been called over the, to DC to testify. He says, no, there's nothing McVeigh could have done. I was going to sink him anyway. And in fact, there's another sub commander named Glenn Donahoe testifies to the same effect. You know, really supporting McVeigh's contention. But I have to point out that McVeigh, McVeigh really never made a contention. He never argued the issue. Because why? He wasn't zigzagging. And he's a naval captain. So what technically it means is this, I mean, this story gets into all kinds of issues of command and responsibility, taking responsibility. He takes responsibility even though, I'll jump to the end here. I'm not gonna jump to the end. <laughs> he takes responsibility even though it, it, it wouldn't have saved the ship. Um, and I wrote another piece for the New York Times. I said sometimes you just you wanna reach out and grab McVeigh and shake him and say, forgive yourself, because in November of 1968, he walks to the steps of his house in Winvian, in Litchfield, Connecticut, and shoots himself. Unable to, to 
live with the guilt. And there are many things going on in his life. It wasn't just this. I was lucky enough to meet his stepson and go to that house and talk with his stepson and, and his two sons as well. Um, but he never complained. And you wish sometimes that he would have. But he took total responsibility for this disaster. Yeah. Did you want to show the uh, trailer for 12 Strong? Um, yeah? OK, sure. Let's show it. Thanks so for that's another lesson. You know, this idea of taking responsibility. And the, I just want to, finally, McVeigh is exonerated in uh, July of 2000. The Navy and both the US Congress, not at that exact moment, but they begin to adopt the posture that McVeigh is not thought to be uh, culpable for this disaster and so many deaths. So his record and his, his memory are somehow are, are, are left in better shape. And when I asked the survivors, why did you stick up for him? I said, because he never blamed anybody else. He took responsibility. The other people that got the, the, the letters of reprimand, and they, they oh, not me, I didn't do, you know, it wasn't my fault, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we're gonna, we'll end tonight, uh, and we can talk after we see this trailer. Oh, we have a, yes, ma'am. Um, this is very minor, but do you know why he didn't zigzag? I mean, I know it was. Yeah, issue, yeah, <clears throat> this is what I mean. This he was supposed to, and he didn't. Exactly. It, it, it is dark, it's murky. I, I, I went back through all the weather records, looked at that night, uh, all the naval records, and it was, uh, the conditions were such that he was permitted to sail on a straight line course at about 16, 17 knots because it really was a misty, murky, occluded night. But then this thing happened, and so boom, you know, yeah, Th that, that nabbed him. Okay, um, it, anyone, uh, what, should we just roll it? It's the trailer, movie trailer to a movie called 12 Strong based on my book, Horse Soldiers. Is You taking me to school again? Uh-huh, and picking you up. Daddy. Two planes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an American terrorist attack. What is that, a part of some drill? Ain't no drill. 19 men attacked our country. The 12 of you will be the first ones to fight back. How do you love your family and leave them to go to war? I have two hours. I'll be really quick. Not a chance. Holding out is the only way I can guarantee you come back to me. War's gonna be only a week. <laughs> I don't care how long you're gone, as long as you come back. Come on! Come on! Three! Four! Every step we take is gonna be on a minefield from a hundred different wars. Odds are we're not all gonna make it out of this one. We don't take that city. World Trade Center's just the beginning. Teaming up with the general of the Northern Alliance that we know nothing about. General, you show me exactly where we're going. Well, what are the mountains? We take horses. All right, who's ridden before? Anyone? Summer camp when I was nine. Spring break when I was pretty hammered. Does it have a name? The name. Hey, this will be fun. We're outnumbered. 50,000 Taliban and Al Qaeda fighters. We're on our own. I can't order anyone to do this. Do you want to surrender? Keep your finger on the trigger. Stay there. Oh, God. Well, I won't bat down. There's no playbook here. We're going to have to write it ourselves. No, I won't bat down. I ain't losing one man on this team. You could stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't bat down. We're fighting with horsemen against tanks. weapon in history is this. There ain't no easy way out. If you die, that's a letter you and your wife are gonna wish you wrote. Hey, I made her a promise. I'm coming home. Walk back down. Twelve Strong, the declassified true story of the horse soldiers. That's the same thing. Um, so a couple of people had seen that movie. 
Boy, we're really jumping around here in the history of warfare. You couldn't get a more different example of conflict resolution, which is one way to think about battle and combat, than what happened in Afghanistan in 2001 and say the more symmetrical battlefield conflict of World War II, where you had forces taking land and property and lives and marching into Germany. What did we do in Afghanistan in 2001? We weren't trying to take land necessarily, we we're trying to collapse the Taliban with a very small group of American soldiers called special forces. And it worked until about 2002, until we went to Iraq and then let our foot off the gas and then returned to Afghanistan in 09, 10, et cetera, and finally just two Augusts ago. Um, it worked for a whole bunch of reasons. I don't know, um, is anyone having, is anyone here been in special forces or familiar with the term unconventional warfare? So, um, anyone have, have any questions about this? Has anyone read uh, Horse Soldiers? Ah, there you go, you win the door prize. <laughs> um, I'll do, what I'll do is I, I want to leave you with this, or, or I'll take more questions, but when 9-11 happened, say it's like Pearl Harbor, right? So when Pearl Harbor happened, we massed this enormous war effort to crush Japan and, and, uh, and then finally Germany. Um, when 9-11 happened, we did not mass an enormous force, right? I mean, it was in the news, but you're thinking, well, what's going on in Afghanistan? Well. Two teams of 12 Special Forces soldiers are infiltrated by Chinook helicopter late at night, deep into Afghanistan, and as Ann points out, they've been led by CAA, CIA paramilitary teams who have kept lines of communication open all through the 80s and 90s with, quote, warlords of three or four different tribes that have been battling the Taliban. There's so much we didn't know in 2001 about what was going on over there. But just these small groups of men, led by the CIA, who would sit down in the dirt and say, what do you need? What do you want? What's going on with your, with your group, your tribe? And they said, we got, the CIA uh, would say, we've got some friends coming in. They want to bring you weapons. These different tribes, the Hazaras, the Tajiks, et cetera, had been fighting each other and the Taliban for a decade or more and losing. So the Taliban owned about 90% of the country, 2001. Almost had taken all of it. When 9-11 happened, when I interviewed some Afghans, I went there twice, um, they said, finally, the Americans will come. Why are they on horses? This gets to the point of what happened. Because they don't have any money. They don't have an Air Force. They don't really have tanks or armor. They have horses, and they can ride across the field and charge the Taliban line, which is armored. They do have jets. They do have a lot of gear. And so you have this ragtag group of, quote, indigenous Afghan fighters who do not like the Taliban. And they would be fighting for decades. An example would be they charge the line. They overrun the Taliban line because the, the mechanized weapon can't adjust its fire quickly enough to a person on horseback, right? So they get overwhelmed and overrun. They would retreat, drive their tanks and trucks to the next hilltop, turn around, and then blast the Afghans off the hill that they had just taken. And then, and then the Afghans would retreat and their horses up into the mountains where they couldn't be pursued. This goes on. Uh, year after year. 9-11 happens, these 12, there are two teams of 12, and there are actually several hundred in the early, early days, but not many. And remember, there are thousands and thousands of trained up Taliban fighters. They bring in a laser designator. Anyone know what that is? It's, on a, it's in a backpack or it's on a tripod, and you can laze a target, you can laze a Toyota truck, and the answer up to the pilots um, in the Air Force was, from the ground was, if you see any wheeled vehicles on the terrain, bomb them because they're all enemy. And they're like, what do you mean? 
nobody down here who's on our side has a wheeled vehicle. We're all on horseback. He goes, you're kidding. No, it's the truth. So they would laze the target and the bomb would drop and hit the laser and it would then, it's called a smart bomb, take out just that tank or that Toyota truck. It's very small precision munitions, or the 2,000 pound bombs, but uh, one at a time, and this is what cracked the Taliban's command and control and grip of the battlefield. So now we've, we've run, we've overrun the line, we've taken that hill, and they retreat, and just as they're ready to kind of counterattack, these bombs start dropping out of the sky and take out that, that Taliban armor, and then we take the next ground. So that's how it, and it was, yes ma'am. Well, that's how within six or seven weeks, um, this command and control structure that had been in place run by the Taliban was crushed pretty effectively. I also want to say that the Afghan citizenry was very welcoming to the coalition of forces that had come in after 9-11 um, and, and, and done this work. Um, we ended up in a very different place in Afghanistan for all kinds of reasons. I just updated horse soldiers by interviewing many of the players from 20 years ago about how they felt about today. So it's, it's long and complicated and, and, and sad. But back then, um, using this small force was very effective. Yes, ma'am. So you were riding harm's way in 2001, and 9-11 happened in 2001. Your subsequent books came out after 9-11. What impact did 9-11 have on you wanting to write those books and what you plan to do in the future? That's a good question. So I think I wrote Horse Soldiers because I was trying to understand how, um, um, you're right, 9-11 happened. I was actually on book tour for the World War II book when 9-11 happened. Um, I thought, like a lot of us, I wanted to understand this new language of, quote, violence, or new language of, of threat, and, and where was it coming from, and how had it been resolved in Afghanistan? I started the book in 2003, this book. How, how did it work? And briefly, if you have a moment, it works really in an interesting way. Each one of us in the room are all part of these SF teams. I don't know how many there are here, 30 years. 48 of us maybe, there's just four teams of 12 in this room. And on that team, we can be, each team can be split into four components of three people each. We're all cross-trained. You and I might be medics, you might be uh, communications and weapons, but you know two jobs. And we're all have been deputized. Decision-making goes from the ground up, not from the bottom down. And there was all kinds of thinking now in the business world that's been drawn from the lessons of Afghanistan, for better or for worse, about how you can break, how you, how you work in groups to make decisions. Because this was not a huge command structure operation. It was uh, basically, I, I'm gonna trust this guy right here. I'm the general, I'm gonna send him out. He's gonna work with the warlord. And I'm trusting you that you're gonna make the right decisions to be the right response to 9-11, and you're not gonna screw it up, you're not gonna break any laws, and, and, and because that's how you've been trained. And you, oh, by the way, you speak Dari, you might speak a little Arabic, and you, you're totally in tune with the cultural mores and religious mores of the group, because you become part of them in order to bond with them to work together to one goal, so. Doug, we're gonna do one last question here, and then. This might be an interesting question. Um, I was born in World War II, and my dad and all my uncles uh, fought in World War II. Uh, my brothers fought in Vietnam, and uh, also have nieces and nephews that were in Afghanistan. Oh, wow. yeah. And I worked in the aerospace and defense industry for 40 years. I've been around defense people. I'm interested in your perspective, having written about all three of those, about the men and women that came back and how they felt about returning to the United States. World War II was wonderful. Uh, Afghanistan, Middle East was wonderful. But Vietnam was horrible. And I'm just wondering, in the course of writing about these and interviewing, did that come up at all? Sure did. I, I can answer that 
pretty succinctly this way by using the example of Stan Parker, who you saw in that video. Remember, he's a young private in, in Vietnam, and he comes home, he really does change his uniform in the California airport and ends up back in Indiana where he, where he grew up. Um, he then is still in, a, he, he's in Afghanistan when I meet him, and he's flying home in his uniform, and over the intercom, the pilot says, we have a special guest on board, Stanley Parker. He's in, uh, one of the older serving Army uh, uh, NCOs. And if anyone has a first class seat, would you please give it up for Stanley? And a couple of people offered their first class seats for Stanley. We're going to move back into coach so that he could sit up there. And he, first of all, he, did, he, he looked around like, where's his voice coming from? <laughs> you know, me, really? And he finally, they, and they have to coax him forward. And he wa as he's walking forward through the cabin, he says, wow, this is really different than <laughs> Vietnam. But he says, but you know what? I bet if they knew about Vietnam, they wouldn't be giving me this seat. He, he still is carrying that sense of that war and that story with him. And um, it was through the process of working on this book with him that I really feel he came to a clear understanding of what he lived through. But that. You're exactly right. There, there it is in one person, both experiences. Well, yes. Thanks. I want to thank Doug and his wife, Anne, for being here tonight. And we have a gift for you. Thank you. I uh, just want to thank the foundation again, Armed Forces Thanksgiving, for helping us bring Doug to our uh, auditorium this evening. And Doug's going to be out in the uh, lobby signing books. So please go ahead yeah. and head out there. Thank There's a dessert reception. Too. Yeah, thank you so much for spending the time with me and allowing me to talk about some of these stories. I hope they've been of some meaning to you. and, and uh, I really appreciate your presence, and thank you both for having me down here. So.